All right, it's good to be here. Good to see everybody, and uh, hope everybody's doing all right. Hope everybody is ready for 70 degrees next two days. Yeah, a little flash of like, what the heck is going on here? 75, maybe even like almost 80 on Monday. That's crazy, craziness. Anyway, it's just good to be together. Um, I don't know how many know like what a pastor actually does. Oop. That was... Do we have that on video? I'm going to send that to funny videos. That's a good one. That's pretty good. Yeah, that was... Now for my next trick, <laughs> look over here. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, thank you, Danielle. I appreciate it. Uh, today is a new day, and you never know what's going to happen. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. You need to... Uh, yeah, well, pay no attention to the woman behind the... Banner. <laughs> um, so let's try that again for the video, right? Now, um, so my job as a pastor, what do I do all day? It's a good question. People wonder what I do all day. Um, I wonder what I do all day. been doing it for a long time, though. So whatever it is, I've been doing it for quite a while, almost 20 years. Isn't that a long time? It's a long time to be doing something. 11 years here at Lifetree. Um, but there's one word that kind of jumps out in Scripture about what ministers do, pastors in particular, and that my job is to equip it's, a, it's an interesting word to equip. What does it mean to equip things? And so there are kind of four like, key areas that I would, I would you know, define for myself about what that means that I, I gained from somebody else. I heard another pastor teach on it. I was like, oh, that's really good. And you may have heard me share about this before, but there are four different ways that as a pastor I can equip the church, you, people, to grow in our relationship with God, to do the work um, that God has called us to do on this earth. And the first is this, to heal what's broken. The idea of like mending a net. Think of like a fisherman, like if I'm trying to catch fish, but the net is ripped and you pull it up and the fish just swim through the hole, right? Not very effective. So to mend the net, to repair what's broken. So it's asking the question, where are the areas of brokenness? And what can we as a church, how can we help heal what's been broken? Right? There are times in our lives where we all go, yeah, I'm broken. But God can heal what's broken. So how can God use me to do that? The second is to restore what's been taken. There are times where the enemy will take things from us. He'll take our joy. He'll take hope. He'll take peace. He'll take our security, our foundation. He'll take all those things from us, our dreams. And God says, hey, I'm going to equip pastors to restore what's been taken. So one of, my, one of my gifts, one of my, not gifts like I have it, but one of the things I get to do is I get to help God, restore back what the enemy may have taken. The third is to prepare. Think of like preparing a ship for a journey, right? The ship is going to go out for like across, you know, across the ocean. Right, it's going to need supplies. It's going to need food. It's going to need fuel, you know, medical, radio equipment, all sorts of stuff, right? Lifeboats. And so you're going to load all these things into the ship knowing that along the way you're going to need these things. So one of my jobs, again, as a pastor is to say, okay, what are you going to need for the journey of life? And how do I prepare you? How do I help you have those things? Yeah, are you tracking with me? Is this making any sense? Yeah, maybe a little bit? Okay, okay. Hope so. Um, and if not, it doesn't matter because um, nobody else knows what I do. Anyway, um, but those are, that's the third. And then the last one, the fourth one, is to train like a soldier for battle. Like there are fights you're going to face down the road and my hope and my task is to make sure that you have what you need to meet the demands of those battles, that you won't walk into those battles and go, I have no idea how to fight here. I'm overmatched. I didn't expect this. So to help you anticipate, these are the battles that are going to come, and I'm going to help train you. Guys, called pastors to help train people. So pastors, heal what's broken, restore what's been taken, prepare for the journey, and train for battle. Those four things. And so this is a little bit like kind of behind the curtain a little bit about what I do. Every time I go to preach a message or pre prepare messages, I'm always thinking, what's this one? Is this, is this a heal what's broken message or is this a, a restore what's taken, right? Is this a prepare for the journey message or is this a train for battle message? And it's each one of those. So the reason I tell you that is we're starting a new series tonight. And it's, a, it's one of these series that it's going to be, ready, drum roll, which one? It's going to be a... Train for battle. 
That's what this is going to be about. This is a, hey, there are some fights ahead of you. Um, to be honest, you may actually be in the fight right now. Most likely, we're all in the middle of these fights. Um, but so it's a now and coming in the future, you're going to have both. And so my goal for these next few weeks is to help say, here, I'm going to just give you all the weapons you're going to need to fight these battles and that you can come out of them and say, all right, we've successfully conquered these. They haven't defeated me. God has given me what I need to walk through this. All right? Does that make sense? All right, just to kind of set expectation about what we're going to be talking about. So to get there, I kind of just need to do a quick history lesson to kind of frame where we're going to go with the story, and then I'll get there. So you remember, like, way back in the beginning, right, God spoke to Abraham. We just kind of did this series, Promises, right? God says to Abraham, hey, I'm going to send you out. You're going to be a blessing to all people. He's one guy. I'm going to make a nation out of you. Fast forward, right, you get Isaac, and then Jacob, and then all the down, Joseph, and then Joseph brings, right, Joseph ends up in Egypt, and then, you know, they kind of, Abraham's descendants kind of begin to grow, like, and sort of populate here, and they, they, when they showed up in Egypt, there was just a, a few of them, like maybe, you know, 50, 60, 70 folks in there, right, and then when they, now they're in Egypt, and then they become, right, the Pharaoh dies, and then the next king comes along who doesn't know anything about Joseph, and then they say, hey, these people are, they're growing a lot, let's enslave them, and so for 400 years, the descendants of Abraham, which we know are the Israelites, right, the children of Israel, they're now becoming sort of like this nation without a leader, without a, without a place, without a home. They're enslaved 400 years. They're just living in Egypt as slaves, and then, you know, they kind of fast forward, and Moses, God sends Moses, I'm going to deliver you, I'm going to get you out of, I'm going to, I, that promise I made to Abraham, I'm still working on it, it's still coming, it's just a long promise. And so Moses, you know, says, okay, we're going to lead him out. We know the whole story. I'm not going into it. Just you get the idea. He leads them out. And so now they get out of Egypt. They cross the, the they get into the, the desert. They're going on their way to the promised land. And God says, okay, as you're on your way, I just want to give you some, some rules, some guidelines for how to be in relationship with me, right? Over these next, now this new season of life for you, now that you're no longer slaves, this is how you get to worship me. And he gives Moses on a mountaintop and he gives Moses, what, the 10 commandments, right? He says, here's how you're going to do it. And these are really terms of a covenant. Here's how to be in relationship with me. You know, when bride and groom stand there and they say, do you, right? Vows. You make promises to each other. These are terms of the relationship. I agree to do these things and you agree. This is how we're going to stay in relationship and it's going to work, right? And so God is saying through the commandments, this is how you're going to stay in relationship with me. It wasn't just do these things and you get points. It was, this is how, it's about a relationship. So he gives them to those right? And I want to zero in on the second commandment. Okay, get up there. So now they're here. Second commandment. Uh, we can read it in Exodus chapter 20, uh, verse 1. And this is what it says. It says, then God gave the people all these instructions, commandments, right? And he says, I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery, right? So here comes the first commandment, right? First one is this. You must not have any other God but me, right? That's the first one, right? No, no other gods, right? The second one here, he says this, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. All right, so we're going to zero in kind of here on this second commandment. Throughout Scripture, God is really loud, really loud about the danger of idols. Like, it's really all over, New Testament, Old Testament, it's throughout the book. You read the letter, he is always talking about idols. They're dangerous, they're foolish, don't play around. God is not messing around when it comes to idols. Isaiah, we can, we can read it, and so I'm going to read a few scriptures for you. Isaiah chapter 44, I love this one. How foolish are those who manufacture idols. These prized objects are really worthless. The people who worship idols don't know this, so they're all put to shame. Verse 10, he says this. Who but a fool would make his own God? Isn't that a great question? Who but a fool would make his own God? An idol that cannot help him one bit. All who worship idols will be disgraced along with this, these craftsmen, mere humans who claim they can make a God. I can make a God. Anybody here got the power to make a God? Can you make a God? I'd like, yeah, yeah. I mean, some of us can't make breakfast. Right? You can make a God, right? 
says, they may all stand together, but they will stand in terror and shame. Psalm 115, this is a good one. I love this one, Psalm 115, here we go. Idols may have mouths, but they can't speak. You can actually like carve a little mouth, but they can't speak. And eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. And noses, but they cannot smell. They don't have COVID, they just can't smell. Right? They have hands, but can't feel. Feet, but can't walk. Throats, but can't make a sound. And those who make idols are just like them. Ouch as are all who trust in them. God is emphasizing here the futility of idol worship. It's foolish, it's nonsensical, and it, but here's the thing that's so crazy about it. It keeps happening. It keeps happening. And here's what makes idols so dangerous. Like, as God was giving the children of Israel, is that God was on the mountain giving Moses this commandment. The children were down, the, the, the whole nations, they're down making a literal idol out of gold earrings, right? They're making a calf, a golden calf. Remember Aaron says, I just threw some stuff in the fire and it bounced out like a, like a cow. Like, Come on, dude. Like, I mean, that just lets you know the intelligence of those who are making idols, right? They're turning, they're getting dumb. Like you have, you got a mind, but you're not using it. Here we go. God is emphasizing, and here's what makes idols so dangerous. It's in the New Testament. John captures it so well. First John chapter 5, verse 21, it says, Dear children, the actual word is idols here, but he says, he says it like this. Keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Because ultimately, that's what idols do. They take God's place in your heart. The calf was never meant, they were never going to be like, hey, let's worship cows. It wasn't about that. They just wanted something they could see that was going to represent God. Because they wanted to take God's place. Because I can't see God. I can't talk to God. I just want something tangible. I know it's lesser, but I want to worship that because at least I can touch it. It was a substitute, a replacement. They're imitations. Here's the question. Why would anybody ever try to substitute an idol for God? If you have God, why would you ever even be drawn to an idol in the first place? And it's very simple, okay? Idols lie. They deceive. Again, training for battle, right? Understand the context of what we're talking about. Idols lie. They promise you a better deal than what God offers. This is what they do. They promise that whatever you want, you're going to have it, and they hide the small print. That's what they do. They bury it. It's way down. You never see it. Author Andy Crouch, uh, if you haven't read anything by him, you should. He's profound. It's incredible. But he says this, it turns out that there is a clear pattern to idolatry. He says, all idols begin by offering great things for a small price. All idols, he continues, then fail more and more consistently to deliver on their original promises while ratcheting up their demands, which initially seems so reasonable for worship and sacrifice. And he quotes a guy named Jeffrey Santanova who said this, very simple, it's my smile, I love this. Idols ask for more and more while giving less and less until eventually they demand everything and give nothing. Oh, man, come on. It's brutal, it's brutal. That's why God is so loud about it all throughout the scriptures. That's insidious. You don't even know it. You, you, just, you hear it and you buy into it. The next few weeks, we're going to be exploring this. We're going to study from the story of Daniel. So we're going to fast forward to the story of Daniel. And it's a study of contrasts. It really contrasts Daniel, who worshipped the living God, and an entire society and culture that worshipped idols. Anything else, a replacement for God. They called it God, but they served other things. And I think it's going to help us train ourselves for the battles that we are in right now in our world. I always pray that these messages would be relevant to the moment, timely. That we're, Daniel, so many years ago, I mean, we're talking generations, thousands of years ago, 27, 2,600 years ago, the story of Daniel takes place. That's a long time ago. But there's something in there that's relevant for us today. So the story begins 600 BC, around there, 606 BC is when Daniel kind of happens. And it, now think about this. After all it took for God to speak to Abraham, convince Abraham to follow him, lead them, right? Build them up, survive the knuckleheads, Jacob and Esau, do all this kind of stuff, right? He gets them to, 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 
to Joseph. They get to Egypt. He rescues them from Egypt. He leads them through the promised land. They continue to, to, to walk away from God. Finally, that whole generation passes. Joshua leads them into the promised land. They're there. They're conquering the land. They're finally established. Everything that God promised is coming true, and they continue to abandon God. So much so that God says, okay, I can't ignore the way that you are violating the terms of the covenant, the relationship. I can't ignore it. And so what you have is we get to this place where if you remember in Jeremiah 29, 11, that really well-quoted scripture says, I know the plans I have for you, right? Well, God is telling those people, that's through the words of Jeremiah, he's telling the people of Israel that because they're about to get conquered, by Babylon. And for 70 years, they're going to be enslaved again by Babylon. And that's the story of Daniel. In the beginning, that beginning of that 70 years where they're conquered by Babylon, that's where the story starts. These people who have constantly walked away from God, so stubborn. And we pick up the story now, the beginning of, of, of Daniel, chapter 1, and this is where we're going to pick it up. Verse 3, he says this, and it'll be on the screen. It says, the king ordered... Okay, Ashpenaz. Thank you, Shana. Ashpenaz, his chief of staff. Again, good child name, maybe dog, could be cat. Um, his chief of staff to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. So the king's like, hey, let's take some of these young men, right? Let's bring them to, to the palace. And he says this in verse 4, select only strong healthy and good-looking young men. He said, make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning and gifted with knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon, the best and the brightest, Ethan, the best and the brightest. Just that would be right. Yeah, young men, right? Best, brightest, good-looking, you know. I mean, hey, he's my son, you know. So the king says, listen, assign them a daily ration of food and wine from my own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and they would enter the royal service, right? It says, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. They're about 19, 18, 19, 20, somewhere in that range at this point. The chief of staff renames them with Babylonian names. Daniel becomes Belteshazzar. Hananiah is called Shadrach. Mishael was called Meshach, Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king, and he asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now, God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel, verse 10, but he responded, I'm afraid of my lord, the king, who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I'm afraid the king's going to have me beheaded. Right? Yeah. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and said, okay, here's the deal. Just test us. Please test us for 10 I know. So he's not going to the, the chief of staff. He just goes to the attendant. You know, hey, listen, just test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water. At the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision, listen, pay attention to this, in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. And God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. Almost done. Wrap it up. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service, and verse 20 wraps it up. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Let's pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, as we look to this text, as we understand this story, God, train us, prepare us for the battles that are to come. Let us not fail to prepare ourselves adequately and give in 
and succumb to the enemy that seeks to take us down, to minimize our effectiveness, to separate us from you. God, train us for battle. Amen. So I'd just like to compare for a moment Daniel with the chief of staff, okay? The chief of staff just wanted Daniel to do what everybody else was doing. Just do what everybody else is doing. I don't want to eat that. I don't care. You're going to do what everybody else is doing, right? My orders, I don't want to lose my head. So you're going to do what everybody else is doing. He wanted the king to be pleased with the product that he was delivering, that these young men look good. He didn't want there to be any blame on him, that he didn't follow the, the process, the, the, the order. They're going to do what the king says to do. They're going to conform, and I, want, I need that. The chief of staff expressed concern for one thing above, above all else. Ready? It was this. He wanted the approval of the king. That's what he wanted. And he wanted to make sure that others approved of his work The Babylonians here greatly valued aptitude and competence, and you can't blame them. That sounds good. How many think competence and, like, that sounds pretty good. Would you like to hire people that are, you know, low on aptitude and competence? Would you like to work with people that are, would you like to work for people that are low in aptitude and competence? How many have? No, don't raise your hand. Don't don't raise your hand. Okay. It's not a bad value. It's good to value aptitude and competence and those things. There's nothing wrong with that. But because the chief of staff so valued approval, he was set on Daniel conforming to what everyone around him was doing. You're going to eat what everybody else is eating. You're going to go through the same stuff. Now, Daniel was also concerned with approval. But it wasn't the king's, and it wasn't the chief of staff's, and it wasn't even the attendant's approval. He was concerned with what God thought. Very simply, it's a study in contrast. He cared what God thought, and he refused to violate what he thought was right just for the approval of the king. I'm not going to do that. I, I don't, he didn't care that much. It was clear who he valued. And here's what's ironic. He elevated God's approval over the king's approval, and he got both. He got both. And here we find our, our first idol. We're doing a series called American Idols, right? This is what we're doing, American Idols. And the idol that we find here is the idol of approval. The idol of approval. It's rooted in the opinions of other people. How many are going, "Ah, I've heard this. I know this. There's nothing you're going to tell me that's new. And maybe not. Maybe you've heard all this before. But I feel like this is a timely message that we need to hear today. There's a few questions that I think would help us understand this idol a little better than perhaps we, we think today. What does the idol of approval promise? It promises validation, that you will feel accepted and valuable and worthy. And who doesn't want to feel accepted? Right? Who doesn't want to feel like, ah, oh, I, I got the pat on the back. I did a good job. It makes us feel good. I mean, there's chemical things that happen in our brain when we're, when we're accepted, when people approve of us. There's things that happen. You, it's, it's good, right? You get more with sugar, right, than with, right? There's something about Parenting even, we know this. You, you, you want to reinforce your kids with positive stuff. There's something about approval and encouragement. It's not bad. There's something in there. For Daniel, it, it was clear that the approval of the king was a matter of life and death. If the king didn't approve of Daniel, he was going to die. He was just a captive from Babylon. He wasn't anybody special. He shouldn't even be here. He was only there because apparently he happened to win the gene pool lottery. He looked good. He was young, born at the right time. That's it. He's trained. If the king approves, all's going to be well. If the king doesn't approve, we don't hear about Daniel. The idol of approval promises validation, but here's what it demands of us. Here's, what, here's remember, that it promises much, but here's now that, that small print. What does it demand from us? Well, the first thing it demands from us is conformity. You're going to do what everybody else is doing. You want approval? You're going to do what everybody else is doing. Daniel was expected to eat and learn and grow just like everybody else. Just do what everybody else is doing. And the second part of that conformity piece is comparison. Look around. You need to, I'm going to compare you to everybody else. How do you look in relation to those all around you? So, so here's what it demands. It demands conformity and it demands comparison. When it seems to be working for everybody else, hey, listen, it's working. Comparison and conformity, those are some powerful things. Hey, it's working for everybody else. Why do you got to be different? 
Just do what everybody else is doing. You want my approval? Fit in. And here's where the idol begins to fall short because we know this. We all know this. We've felt it. We've experienced it. The idol, the approval of others is arbitrary and it's unfair. It makes unqualified people your judge. See, when we worship approval, we seat other people on the throne of our life. We just go, okay, you tell me how am I doing. You tell me what I'm worth. You tell me. And we put the power in the hands of somebody who maybe today they like us and tomorrow they don't. You ever, ever meet somebody, you go, they're a nice person. The next time you see them, you go, I don't know what I was thinking. They're not nice. I don't like them as much today as I used to. Like, we, we're fickle. We change. We go like that. We know we are more than what is seen, but it doesn't matter when approval is your idol. As if we needed any more examples, I mean, our world constantly gives us examples of how approval is a brutal idol because it's never enough. You read the news the last month, there have been two beauty pageant winners who have taken their own lives in the last month. Young ladies, there's a recent... Recently, just this past week, a young college soccer goalie did likewise. And I'm not here to presume on why they took their own lives. Young, young people just taking, committing suicide, doing things like that. I don't know. I don't want to presume. But here's what we, it's clear, that there is constant pressure in our world for the approval of others. There's constant pressure to let others tell us that we're worthy, that we're okay, that we're valuable, to validate our being. In our cancel culture, whew, approval is balanced on a knife's edge. You may be approved today. Everybody may be, it just happened a few weeks ago. There was somebody, something happened, and all of social media got behind him. This person is great. This other person is lousy. You should support this person. And literally within 24 hours, this person that they were all championing, oh, we found some old tweets from them. So though they were sympathetic today, now you're the villain. See, because the approval of our society is so superficial. We put the power in the hands of people who should have no business having power over us. We live in a world that seeks to convince us that their opinion of us matters and that we need their approval. It's an idol and we need to refuse to bow to it. It will promise you everything and deliver nothing. It will demand more and more and give less and less. As smart as we are, as smart as we are, we'll go, yeah, I don't. We all know this. We all know this. I don't bow to the idol of approval. None of us do. None of us do. Listen, every single day that idol comes back. It doesn't matter how old you are. The older we are, it doesn't get easier. It's not like now that I'm old, nobody, I don't care about the approval of others. At every stage of our life, we care about approval. We can be tempted to seek approval for what we stand for. If we seek the approval of the right or the left, you can have it. If you will, say this, do that, defend this, attack that, celebrate those things. I'm telling you, you can play the game and win the approval of whatever demographic you want if you will say the right things. Ask yourself, am I doing this because it's right or because I'm just trying to seek approval? There can be a temptation to seek approval for what we have. If we seek the approval of our peers, you can get it. You want the approval of your peers? You can get the approval of your peers. All you got to do is buy this, go there, attain that. Homes, cars, clothes, wealth, whatever. There can be the temptation to seek approval for what we do. If we seek the approval of those we consider ahead of us or superiors in any way, we can get their approval if we'll sacrifice these things, if we spend that, if we help do that, if we, if we stop doing this. Listen, just work a little more. If we can seek approval for our children's successes, we can try and say, hey, listen, I want to be validated by what my kids are doing, you know, and so we celebrate it all the time, you know, like, I'm not, I'm not 
judging anybody, right? We've got all the stickers, though, on all of our cars. My kid's an honor roll student. Well, my kid could kick your honor roll student's butt, you know? We got, like, everybody's like trying to, these are my kids, and we're trying to seek approval from other people based on what's on our cars. We seek approval based on our physical fitness, on how we've, the vacations we've gone on, right? Let me, let me tell you about my thing. It's like, listen, we're constantly playing to an audience of others. Even the approval for what we give and serve. We're constantly, oh man, you see people trying to take, you know, hey, look at all the good I'm doing. Thank you for telling me. Thank you for telling me. How about you just do it? Because it's right, not for the approval, not for the credit. When we worship the idol of approval, we have to continually keep up with the demands, the demands of acceptance. It makes us a slave to the opinions of others. Okay. But there's hope. But there's hope. Because we have a true source of approval. There's a true source of approval. I love Daniel's name. It's my name. <laughs> it's a good name. I've talked about this plenty of times. Daniel means God is my judge. They changed his name to Belteshazzar. Daniel's got a better ring to it. You know, I, Belteshazzar might be my fantasy football name next year. So. It means this. It means Bel, B-E-L, is my protector. Bel was their god in Babylon. Daniel means God is my judge. El, El is God, Elohim, El, right? So God is my judge, the Hebrew God. This is that God. And they tried to change and reframe his name in a way to attempt to reframe whose approval matters. And here's what Daniel shows us. God is the only worthy judge of our lives. His approval is the only approval that matters. And can I just tell you right now, somebody needs to hear this. God approves of you. God approves of you. He accepts you. There's nothing you can do. You can't be more accepted. You can't be more approved. You can't be more validated. Your life is worthy. He's proud to call you his child. He sees you inside and out. He knows what you are. He knows what you aren't. And he says, that's mine. I love you. Consider, consider that. Consider Jesus. The example of Jesus Philippians chapter 2 says this, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he didn't think equality with God is something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. I love this. The New King James Version, sometimes King James works, it says this, he made himself of no reputation. My translation, Jesus refused to bow to the idol of the approval of others. He says, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I'm not going to live like anyone else. And he continues, he took the humble position of a slave. That's not how kings do it, God. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. That's not how gods come to earth. When he appeared in a human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. That's not how it happens. That's not how you're supposed to conform. You're not supposed to do it like that. You're supposed to come with power and impressive displays of who you are and just... Just shut it all down. Everybody goes, okay, that's clearly God. You're not supposed to come and die like a criminal on a cross. You're not playing along. Now watch what happens when Jesus kept God's approval foremost. Verse 9 of Philippians 2 says, Therefore God elevated him to the place of the highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here's the thing, as flawed as our world is, it can't help but recognize the truth. If we chase approval, we'll never get it. But if we receive it from God, the whole world is going to give it. Nobody approved of Jesus when he was here, it doesn't make sense what you're doing, God. I, would, I wouldn't do it that way. The own followers were saying, Jesus, what are you doing? Not like that. You don't do it that way. 
And guess what? He put, God's, he put God's approval up here, and it tells us that, you know what, one day, who's going to have more approval than Jesus? Every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess. Everybody's going to recognize, oh, yeah, he's worthy. He's worthy. When we keep God on the throne of our lives, when his approval means more than anything else, when he is truly our judge, God is free to give us the competence that stands out because he knows we won't make an idol of it. It's really interesting. Because Daniel chose to elevate God, God made Daniel competent extraordinarily. Maybe some of the reasons that we aren't the people that we're supposed to be or we feel like we were made for more but we're struggling is that we're still too focused on what other people think. And until we can let go of what other people think, God can't give us everything that we're created to be. But if you will say, God, I care, I live for you and you alone, guess what? I don't know. Um, maybe God will give you an unusual aptitude for understanding things. Maybe God will give you special abilities to help others. Maybe God can give you a special, special measure of skills that will be so impressive to other people that kings will go, wow. You may be even found 10 times more capable than anybody else, all because you, God knows that you won't make an idol out of their approval. And what no one else will know, but that you will know, is that it's not because you conform to what everyone else is doing, but it's because you put God on the throne and said, God, I live for you alone. An audience of one. That's it. So how do we train for battle? How do we do this? What are our battle exercises? Here we go. You ready? Here's the so what. Here's the so what. This year is a year of confident hope, so we're calling it the kiss of hope. Right? The kiss of hope. How do we train ourselves for battle? Right? Kiss. Not keep it simple, stupid, although that works, right? We've talked about this early on, but it's what do I keep doing? What do I, what do I improve doing? What do I stop doing? What do I start doing? Kiss. All right, so here's what, what can we keep doing to make sure that we are not bowing to the idol of approval? Keep doing what you know is right, comma, even if it's different than everyone around you. Keep doing what you know is right, comma, even if it's different than everyone around around you. Two, what can you improve doing? How about we improve how we judge other people? Because we can unintentionally or maybe intentionally add to the chorus of people who are saying my approval matters because we can judge people. We tell people, I like that, I don't like that, oh, that's great, that's lousy, that's no good, you should do more of that. And we can add to the chorus to put pressure on people to think that our opinion matters. How about we improve how we judge other people and guard against doing that? Are you pressuring others to conform? Or are you encouraging them to live out the path that God has put in front of you? What do you need to stop doing? That's probably lots of things. I'm just giving you suggestions. You can make up your own. These are just some of mine. But stop comparing yourself to others. Stop looking around. Nobody else is running your race. You have a unique road to walk. Stop looking around. Stop bowing to the approval of others. Stop listening for their affirmation. We do it all the time. All the time. We feed off of the affirmation of others. It's not wrong to listen to advice. It's not wrong for people to encourage. It's not wrong to have people speak into us and encourage us to gain perspective, all those kind of things. But there is a line between the counsel of others, the encouragement of others, and making their, improve, their approval an idol. There's a line there. Manage that. If you make decisions based on how others will respond rather than what you believe is right, that's an idol. If you're making your decisions based on how other people are going to respond to it, rather than what you think is right, it's an idol. Very clear. And so the solution is stop it. Stop it. Doesn't get more complicated. Stop it. And what do you need to start doing? And hopefully we're doing this already, but maybe this is something, if it's new for you, start listening for God's approval. Ask yourself daily this question, was I faithful today? Was I faithful today? 
Even if a hundred other people patted me on the back and told me, I did a great job, that was awesome, way to go, incredible. When I get alone with God, was I faithful to you? Because all of those other voices do not matter. Not nearly as much as this. If I get them out of order, I've made it an idol. I should be paying attention if a hundred other people are saying something. But most of all, God, was I faithful? Did I say what I was... I, listen, just... Okay, I'm just be, I've been pastor long enough. I can tell you these things. After service, there's a lot of people that will come up. Not a lot of people. Like one or two. That will be like, that was a great message. Um, and honestly, there are days where I'll have maybe a little bit more. And you know what? I appreciate it. It's encouraging. It's great. But when I get in my car and I leave this place, the question I ask myself is, God, did I say what you wanted me to say? Because it really doesn't matter if other people liked it. If I, was, if I was preaching for your approval, I would probably preach differently. <laughs> God, was I faithful? Did I say what I was supposed to say? And here's why we need to do this. Because the idol of approval enslaves us. But the living God enables us. People judge us by the little that they see, and God judges us by the full scope of what he sees. We get to go to sleep each day knowing that we are valuable and accepted and full of God's love. I'm telling you, freeing us from the idol of approval, oh, it's liberating. It's liberating. This world is so desperate to control us, to manipulate us, to, to move us with their approval. Watch this. Watch what I can do with this person. I'm going to tell them I like it and watch what they do. You know what? I wrote a short poem. I'm going to close with this. Jen can come on up and the band, whoever's going to come on up. We're going to close with communion. But I wrote a short poem. It's a simple reminder. It's kind of like a confession or an affirmation. We'll put it out on social media so you can, you can read it if you'd like to. But I encourage you to repeat this short poem every day this week. Okay? Here's your action step. Repeat this short poem every day this week. You ready? It goes like this, God is my judge, no one else has that right. His approval matters most, so I walk by faith and not by sight. That's it. I'll say it again. God is my judge. Maybe close your eyes and just listen, let it sink in. God is my judge. No one else has that right. His approval matters most. So I will walk by faith and not by sight. We're going to close with communion. We share communion together each month. It's a reminder that everything comes back to Jesus. Why do we do communion all the time? It's a reminder. Everything in life comes back to Jesus. His death on the cross saved us. It saved us. It's everything. Long before we ever chose God, he loved us and made provision for us. He approved you before you were born. And he was willing to die simply to give you the chance to accept his offer of grace. Listen, communion is not a have to. We don't have to do communion. Ever. We get to do communion. We get to remember how good God is to us. It's our habit of remembering that God alone is worthy of the throne of my heart. No other idol should have that kind of power. Jesus alone has the right to my heart. It's our declaration as we share communion. It's always our declaration. God, I worship you alone. It's a reminder. You died for me. Nobody else did. Nobody else has the right to tell you what you're worth because they didn't die for you. <laughs> he did. The God of all creation is our God and he approves of us. I just want to take a moment. I invite you just to reflect on that for a minute. I'm going to ask Jen. She's just going to sing a song. Just a, once or twice through. This song mm, just puts into words so much of what we've talked about. So I ask you to listen, reflect, let God speak to you. and this, Just examine your heart. If you've perhaps found yourself as, as I was talking and God was just speaking to you saying, yeah, the idol of approval is an issue for you. Listen, it's an issue for me. 
Just confess that. Say, God, I need you to work in me. Forgive me. Lord, release me from the power of that idol. And help me instead to put my hope in you alone. You are my judge. Your approval only matters. So I encourage you to take a few moments as Jen sings and let God speak to you. And I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated, the breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. There at the cross, you paid the debt I owe. Broke my chains, freed my soul. For the first time, I had hope. And thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus. It has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus. You have saved my life. You brought me from the darkness into glorious light. And you took my place laid inside my tomb of sin you were buried for three days but then you walked right out again and now death has no sting and life has no end for i have been transformed by the blood of the lamb and thank you Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. You brought me from the darkness into glorious light. And there is nothing stronger than the wonder-working power of the blood, the blood that calls us sons and daughters. We are ransomed by our Father through the blood, the blood. And thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has brought me life. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. And you brought me from the darkness into glorious light and glory to his name glory to his name there to my heart was the blood applied Sing that. Just sing that. Just lift your voices. Glory.
glory to his name glory to his name and there to my heart was the blood applied and glory to his name one more time glory to his name Glory to His name. Glory to His name. And there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Jesus. The bread that you hold, it represents his body. He suffered because he did what was right over what was popular. Every time we take communion, it's a reminder that Jesus did not play to the crowd. Even better, he loved the crowd, so he didn't do what they expected. He did what was right. Just hold that in your hands. In this moment, God, we thank you for this symbol, this representative of, of your great sacrifice for us, of your great love for us, your unwillingness to bow to the idol of approval. You'd only bow to Father God. God, we thank you for the great love that you have showed us we celebrate it today. It's in your name we pray. Let's eat together. And the cup represents his blood. He promises that we are approved, and that we are accepted. Just hold that in, the, in your hand this moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cup, for your for the the blood that sealed the promise. The promise that says we are accepted. Lord, as, as unworthy as we might feel, there might be those right now saying, I, I am not worthy of anything. God, can't, you can't approve of me. You, I've done too much wrong. I've, done too, I've walked away. I've violated too many times the covenant between me and you, God. There are so many things I've done. God, I've ridiculed you. I've, I've made jokes. I've walked away. I've turned my back countless times. Guys, you can't accept me. That blood, that cup represents the promise never fails. There's no place that our sin can take us that God cannot redeem us from. There's no depth too deep, no height too high, no distance too far, no darkness too dark. The power of His blood is effective. Every single life forgiven. God, you approve of us because you love us. Not because we're worthy on our own, but because you love us. We thank you for the cup that promises us that we are loved. We are your children. We remember and celebrate that in this moment. In your great name we pray. Amen. Would you drink to you? God is good, isn't he? Come on, how good is God? He's so good. You say, God is good? And you say all the time, God is good? All the time. And all the time, God is good. God is good. I'm going to invite the band to close us with a song encourage you again every day every single day remind yourself God is my judge no one else has that right his approval matter, matters most I will walk by faith not by sight team would you lead us
for God. Come on, let's give God, we thank you for your great love for us. As we walk into this week, Lord, continue to free us to know that you approve. That we do not have to live for the approval of those around us because we have a God in heaven who gives us the ultimate approval. We love you and you are good wonderful name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week, everybody.